Before we begin our discussion on any chapter, I wanted to set up some parameters or just let you know what's going to happen. Uh, after my first effort, I had a conference with a student of mine, and it was suggested that it would be easier if I prefaced any specifics with a synopsis of the chapter. So that was what I will do almost first. The first thing I'm going to do is for every chapter I'm going to give you three SAT words. If you want your SAT verbal score to go up, you will underline every word in Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. And if you know them, and know them well, you will do much better on the SAT. But anyway, I will give you three SAT words um, that show up in the chapter, and in my synopsis I will do my best to use them in describing the chapter. And at that point, I will then choose three quotes that really exemplify uh, some of the major aspects of the chapter. I can't go over everything. Uh, that is your job. But I certainly will highlight some things that I think will be helpful. The first SAT word for chapter two is physiognomy, which is a really big word for countenance, which is also a really big word for face. It's about what the outward appearance of someone says about the inside of them. SAT word number two, phantasmagoric. Phantasmagoric is a really big word for ghostly. When Hester Prynne ascends the scaffold, she has these phantasmagoric images that basically rehash all of her life up to that point. SAT word number three, preternaturally, which is just a big word for extraordinary. Um, that's about it. Preternaturally sounds naughty, but it's not. It just means extraordinary. Chapter two is called The Marketplace. The Marketplace is simply the gathering place of Puritan Boston. And it is the marketplace where everyone is gathered to watch Hester Prynne as she leaves the prison and ascends the scaffold. That's basically all that happens. On the way to the scaffold, we are met with a few iron-visaged physiognomies or the faces of some really unhappy women, and they're unhappy because they do not like Hester Prynne. Because basically, um, every woman harbors a secret hatred uh, for the prettiest girl in the room, and Hester is the prettiest girl in town. Nevertheless, Hester proudly walks in front of them, brandishing the scarlet letter on her bosom, uh, which is fun to say. Bosom, bosom, whatever you want to call it. You know what it means. She ascends the scaffold, and everyone in Boston is there. There's even been a half day from school. It's like a snow day. It's like, let's go look at the adulterer day. And as she ascends the scaffold, she has this kind of phantasmagoric rehashing of her life, this kind of ghostly images that play over in her mind, because to a certain extent, she wonders how on earth she ended up in this position, staring down some very judgmental Puritans. But these are her realities. And that is the close of chapter two. Quote number one for chapter two is found in paragraph one, and it explains just what the bearded physiognomies were all waiting for. It might be that an antinomian, a Quaker, or other heterodox religionist was to be scourged out of town, or an idle and vagrant Indian whom the white man's firewater had made riotous about the streets was to be driven with stripes into the shadow of the forest, or in this case, an Indian would have gotten drunk and then whipped out of the city. It might be, too, that a witch like old Mistress Hibbins, uh, the bitter-tempered widow of the magistrate, was to die upon the gallows. In either case, there was very much the same solemnity of demeanor on the part of the spectators as befitted, befitted a people amongst whom religion and law were almost identical. If you don't know what the word theocracy means, make sure you have an understanding of that as you try to negotiate Hester Prynne's um, negotiation with Puritan society. Quote number two. Uh, but before you think about that quote, check out paragraph number five when you can for some excellent dramatic irony. But I don't have time for that right now. Quote number two. Remember at this point there's a whole slew or throng of angry, bitter women outside the prison door waiting for Hester to come out. And they're waiting because she's been in prison for a few months at this point and they are expecting her to look like crap, okay? They can't stand Hester Prynne. She is stunning. And they are, well, not stunning. So just kind of imagine some bad makeup Bette Midlers or some really angry Queen Latifahs 
just big girls who are not pleased, hoping to heaven that she looks like poo. So, here's a quote from them. Um, one of uh, the third autumnal matron, this is paragraph six, states, At the very least, they should have put the brand of the hot iron on Hester Prynne's forehead. Madam Hester would have winced at that, I warrant me. But she, the naughty baggage, little will she care what they put upon the bodice of her gown. You have to love anyone that calls someone naughty baggage. Ah, but, interposed more softly, a young wife, holding a child by the hand. Let her cover the mark as she will. The pang of it will always be in her heart. Which character defends Hester Prynne? The young girl. And it's not just the young girl, but the vision here and the detail that Nathaniel Hawthorne gives you is a young woman holding a child by the hand. What a picture of innocence. The innocence... The innocent do not judge, or at least they are more prone to forgive. But what does the ugliest woman have to say about Hester Prynne? This woman has brought shame upon us all and ought to die. Is there not law for it? Truly there is, both in the scripture and in the statute book. Then let the magistrates, who have made it of no effect, thank themselves if their own wives and daughters go astray. That's always a concern. Once an adulterer, then everyone's going to go and become an adulterer. What do you think this is, American literature? Oh, we'll get to that later. Once Hester leaves the prison, much to the dismay of the angry, bittered women um, surrounding her, Nathaniel Hawthorne gives us this description of Hester Prynne. The young woman was tall, with a figure of perfect elegance on a large scale. This Victoria had no secrets. She had dark and abundant hair, so glossy that it threw off the sunshine with a gleam and a face which, besides being beautiful from regularity of feature and richness of complexion, had the impressiveness belonging to a marked brow and deep black eyes. The girl was preternaturally hot, okay? And it's important to understand that. She'd been in prison for months, and these evil women were waiting for her to come out looking mud-stained, hair all in disarray, and she shows them. She still has it. She still got it going on. Well, I said I'd try to close with Sweetie. And here she goes. She has something to say about Hester Prynne. She's a brick. House. She's mighty mighty. Letting it all hang out. 